Hello, BEDM 107 students for sections one and section two. This is the makeup lecture on intellectual property, and by the end of it, you'll know more than you ever wanted to know about intellectual property, but were afraid to ask. Um, we're going to cover slides 156 to 167. <clears throat> And uh, 156 uh, is the slide that just gives a definition of intellectual property as uh, intangible property that is the product of uh, one's mind. Now, you should also note that in the United States, intellectual property is also referred to as know-how. Um, it's a legal phrase now in the United States, and you will run up against it um, quite often in contracts when dealing with the Americans. Uh, trust the Americans to be able to create new language like that, but they're, uh, they do it and they're bigger than us, so we have to take it into consideration. Now the first type of intellectual property we're going to look at is um, trademarks, and uh, <clears throat> that's a mark used by a business person uh, for the purposes of distinguishing their wares and services from those of their competitors. Now it can be a word, a letter, a name, a symbol, like a logo, or it can be um, a figure as long as it <clears throat> is distinguishable from your competition. We have to look at the difference between trademarks and trade names, which we've already covered when we were over the contract material. So while most of that contract material will not be on the final exam, the concept between trademarks and trade names may be. A trade name is a name that a business uses for trading commercial products or services. Um, it may or may not be a trademark. But uh, the uh, trademark is uh, something that you quite often want to register yourself. Now, <clears throat> if we're looking at slide 159, um, it talks about uh, your two trademark rights. One is an unregistered trademark and the other right, and the other is a uh, registered trademark right. And this gives you different remedies in court and may apply to uh, different situations. An unregistered trademark right is uh, synonymous with the tort of passing off. Uh, when someone's passing off their goods or services as those of another, they can be sued uh, for damages and an injunction under the tort law. However, you can register your trademark with the um, registry in Ottawa, and this provides you um, a, a greater bundle of rights. You don't have to know this for examination purposes, but for example, you could sue for an injunction or damages under passing off. Um, the um, registered trademark allows you to sue for damages, an injunction. It allows you to seize offending goods to stop the importation of um, uh, <clears throat> offending goods if they're coming in from outside the country. And you can actually ask for an accounting for profits, which means if a business has made profits based on their infringement of your, tra your trademark, you can sue them uh, to get that money paid back their profit. Now, um, an unregistered trademark, you think, well, why bother registering if you can have an unregistered trademark and have at least uh, two good remedies? Perfect example of this is um, there's an article in the um, lecture materials that you can read. There is a restaurant in um, San Francisco known as the Stinking Rose Restaurant. The Stinking Rose relates to garlic and cooking. A rose is to cooking as um, uh, <clears throat> um, a garlic is to cooking as a rose is to love. The garlic clove looks like a bit like a rosebud that hasn't yet burst open, and so that's where they got the name. Um, two people in uh, BC said, "Gee, what a great name for a restaurant!" And so they opened up a restaurant here called the Stinking Rose. The one in San Francisco sued them for trademark infringement based on passing off. Their action failed in court because in Vancouver, no one, very, very, or almost literally no one, knew about the restaurant in San Francisco. So if they don't know about the restaurant in San Francisco, how can they be passing off their goods and services as those? Compare that to the case of the Seiko Watch Company. They had a Canadian distributor who sold the Seiko watches plus the lifetime guarantee. Um, someone else went behind the door and got uh, bought a whole bunch of Seiko watches from the company in Japan, brought them over to Canada, and started selling them. Uh, but while they could buy the watches illegally, they could not get the guarantee. So they began selling the watches all across Canada. When the Canadian distributor that had the rights found out about it, he sued the company that was selling the watches. 
And in court, the company that was selling the watches wrongfully said, hey, how can you sue us for passing off? Um, because we're not passing off our goods as your goods. They are exactly the same goods, Seiko watches. However, the uh, distributor in Canada said, no, you're selling the watches, but we're selling the watches and lifetime guarantee. So the goods are not the same and they were allowed to sue them for passing off and stop them uh, from selling the watches. Well, that problem of not dealing in the same market can be eliminated by registering your trademark. So for example, I do legal work under the logo PJH, and someone in uh, Wabaw, Saskatchewan, decides that they want to do their law work under uh, uh, Paul John Henry's. And um, so they use the same letters. And so I find, oh, they're using the same letters as me. Can I sue them for passing off? And the answer is no, because nobody in Wabaw, Saskatchewan would know that I even exist in, in uh, Gibson's British Columbia. So I would fail. But if I register my trademark in Ottawa, then that covers all of Canada and they cannot use a similar or same trademark if it's confusing in the marketplace, uh, if it's at all possible to be confusing in the marketplace. So then I would be able to stop them even though I'm not doing any business in Walbaugh, Saskatchewan and can't imagine ever having an opportunity to do any there. So those are the two trademark uh, remedies that are available. Um, how do you mark your product? Well, I'm going to hold up this um, uh, lecture guide. It's the uh, slide for 161. And you can see that you can mark it with an R in a circle, or M slash T, uh, T slash M, or S slash M, or just an asterisk down to the bottom of your uh, product says this is a registered trademark of such and such a company. We don't have any official uh, regulations in Canada to uh, mark the products, but those are the standard ways. If you're registered or in a circle, if it's an unregistered trademark, then you usually use T slash M. However, if you're a Canadian and you're selling your products in the United States, then you are you have to register down there and you would have to put an R in a circle on your product or you wouldn't be able to, or you'd be a federal law. Okay, so that is um, trademark. How long do they last? Well, um, a registered trademark lasts as long as you are using the product in a trademark sense, or services for that matter, pardon me. Um, and once you stop using it, you begin to lose your trademark rights, and eventually somebody else can do that, um, and begin to use it and not offend you. Um, a registered trademark lasts for 15 years, plus 15 years, plus 15 years, which means that close to the end of the first 15-year period, you can apply for another 15-year extension. And then you can apply for another 15-year extension, and so on and so on indefinitely. Now, one thing I'm going to have to check, and that is that there may have been a change to the regulations now. I did see a, refer a reference in some materials that suggest that we've adopted the universal standard of 10 years plus 10 years plus 10 years, which is what they do in the United States. Okay, but I'll confirm that um, uh, uh, in the next class. So that's the idea of trademarks. Now, copyrights, uh, a copyright automatically exists in any artistic work once you have produced it. So that it can be a literary work, a musical work, um, an artistic work like a statue or a painting or that sort of thing. And um, while you automatically have uh, protection of copyright once you've done the work, um, there are advantages to registering, okay? And that's one of the questions I quite often ask on the um, exam. So um, I have, uh, actually I have written five um, uh, small uh, little uh, children's books. The second I was finished those, I had protection and copyright but I would like to register it for two reasons. Number one is, if I have copyright and somebody copies it, whether they intend to or not, and I sue them for copyright infringement, it's a two-step process for me. I have to prove that I have copyright and I have to prove that they have infringed it. If I register copyright in uh, Ottawa with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, then I only have to say, hey, you have copied uh, you have copied my work. Um, 
<clears throat> and I use the registration as proof, and then it puts the onus on you, the offender, to prove to the court that you did not copy me. Uh, the other reason, so that's the first reason. The other reason is that if you mark it with a small c in a circle and your name and the date that you created the work, after registering it with the Ottawa, then you are protected in all the World Trade Organizations in the world automatically without having to go over there and register. So two really big bonuses for registering. And you always hear people, oh, well, can I put it into an envelope and uh, seal it and mail it to myself and keep it and not open it? And that will prove that I have copyright. And I go, uh, yeah, but why do that? Uh, it's, it costs something like uh, $35 to register your copyright in Ottawa, and then you don't have to worry about losing the envelope. And, and secondly, uh, it still puts you in the position of having to, one, in court, prove that you have copyright, and then two, um, uh, proving that they've infringed it. Make it a reverse onus. File. It's simple. You can do it yourself. You don't even need a lawyer, generally. Okay? So that's copyright. Now, um, uh, you mark your work with a small c in a circle, the date and your name, and your protection lasts for the life of the author plus 50 years. The United States, it's the life of the author plus 75 years, um, but in Canada, it's the life of the author plus 50 years. Okay, so, okay, sorry for that interruption. Um, so it's the life of the author plus 75 years in Canada. Uh, if a company buys the rights, then it's the life of the author plus 50 years. That's all the co company gets, even though a company may go on forever. They're merely holding the rights. They're not the author. Now, if um, uh, you sell your uh, work to a publishing company, if it's a novel, for example, then the publishing company owns all right title interest in and to the copyright. And then they provide you a royalty payment or an upfront lump sum payment or whatever, but they have the rights, um, and they can protect those rights in court. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have no rights at all left over. Um, that happened in the case of Snow versus T.E. Eaton and Company. Uh, Snow was a native Canadian um, artist who did sculptures. Uh, the Eaton's family wanted some sculptures for the Eaton Center in their big foyer of their mall in Toronto. And so um, uh, Snow did the sculptures of some geese in various uh, shapes of flight, and they were suspended from the ceiling, um, and it was really quite a dramatic uh, work of art. Snow came in uh, just before uh, November <clears throat> and uh, looked up and saw that the mall manager had put green bows around the necks of all the geese. And Snow thought, what? My artistic work has turned into a crass advertisement for Christmas and he was very upset and he went to his lawyer and the lawyer said well you may have transferred all right title and interest in and to copyright to the Eaton company but you did not give them the moral rights to the integrity of your work moral rights and so they commenced an action they got into court in something like five days and got an injunction against the Eaton company uh, to uh, forced them to take the bows off the necks of the geese. Now, when the Eaton Center was sold, when uh, T.E. Eaton and company went bankrupt, um, <clears throat> the family owned the geese, and so they were, they were taken down, and they were put in a closet, which I'm sure uh, upset Snow considerably. Um, but uh, the, um, you can do that. You can buy the Mona Lisa and stick it in a closet. Uh, or you can buy the, uh, the sculpture that Snow did and stick it in the closet. You don't have to display it. You just cannot change it. Um, apparently the uh, geese have now been uh, um, either sold to um, the mall or whatever because they're back up. And if I remember next class, I'll bring you a picture that uh, I have in some of my materials of those, um, those geese. So that's the concept of um, copyright. So we've done... Uh, Trademarks, copyright, and now we're going to get into um, industrial designs. An industrial design is a shape or configuration um, of a, um, uh, an object which is pleasing to the eye, um, and you can take that shape and you can register it um, under the Industrial Design Act. 
<clears throat> and that will be protected for a 10-year period. Now, I want you to be careful because I'm not sure about the 14th edition of the textbook, but the 13th edition said it was protected for a five-year period, and then you could do a five-year renewal. Well, um, that was the same as the United States um, under their design patent. You'd have it for five years plus a five-year renewal, um, but uh, they, uh, they changed and made it a 10-year period, and so I think um, I definitely know we have followed suit. It's now a 10-year period, so don't fall into that trap. You're protected for a 10-year period. Once it's over, it's just um, over. There's no right to renew, <clears throat> and uh, you lose the industrial design protection. So you mark your product with a D in a circle and uh, uh, probably the name of the holder, and that's all that we have in the way of marking the product. Um, <clears throat> and you're protected for a 10-year period, like I said. Um, the, uh, what you have to remember, though, is that um, uh, you can actually get longer protection. For example, the Heinz ketchup bottle, we all know that shape. They filed that design in 1986, which means after a 10-year period, it fell into the public domain in uh, 1996. Another company began to use a bottle of somewhat the same shape, and the Heinz company um, sued them, but not for design infringement. What they did was they used the bottle consistently for ketchup, relish, um, uh, mustard, and the shape became synonymous with Heinz. And so they sued uh, because they said the shape of the bottle was an unregistered trademark, uh, which I think was really, really quite uh, brilliant on their part. So they used it consistently for 10 years, and then it no longer is protected by the Industrial Design Act, but it is now protected by the um, unregistered right in, of uh, trademark. That brings us to patents. And a uh, patent is the grant of an inventor uh, for a monopoly over a, a product or a process um, for a 20-year period. Industrial designs, 10 years. Patents, 20 year gives you a 20-year monopoly in the marketplace to make as much profit as you possibly can, but on the understanding that um, some things are so important for the good of society as a whole, your monopoly comes to an end, and then there can be competition in the marketplace to help protect the consumer. It has to have utility, ingenuity, and uh, novelty. So it has to be new novelty. It has to be useful utility, and it um, uh, has to have some genius element in the creation of it. And if those three elements are there, bingo, you can uh, get a patent on it. It used to be that we thought we could only get patents on uh, products, but some very clever lawyer in the United States figured out that you could patent a process because there was nothing in the act that said you couldn't. So now you can patent a product or a process. Marking your work, well, in Canada um, and the United States, you put a P and then the patent number. Um, the, and that protects you for 20 years. But if you have a very clever lawyer, it can actually extend that period of 20 years to about 23 years. Because when you file a patent, um, <clears throat> the, between the time that you file it and it gets processed by the government is about two years. So you put patent pending on your product, and it is a signal to everybody that, hey, I've applied for a patent, and if you copy my product um, and I subsequently get my patent, I can sue you. Um, if you don't put patent pending on there, then uh, they, they're entitled to use it and you can't stop them. So you have to put patent pending. And then once your patent is prose prosecuted, then you put the patent number on it. But that two-year period while you're filing can actually be extended to three and sometimes four years just by being very slow in filing the documents with the registrar's office and, uh, you know, dragging your feet. And they, <clears throat> you file and it takes them at least three months to even acknowledge that they've received it because they're so um, uh, overworked and underpaid. And then you have six months to, uh, uh, to respond. Um, and so you just make sure that you use up the full six months and then file your response to their initial uh, response. And they'll come back and they'll ask for some corrections or changes and you drag it out for another six months before you actually file. So by that time, you can actually extend it for three to four years. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's patents, copyrights, industrial designs, and uh, trademarks. Now, <clears throat> um, the uh, oh, let's see, there was something else I wanted to tell you about trademarks. Oh yeah, the key thing is that you are protected from the date of first use. Okay, who has the best trademark right? So that fellow that I was talking about, that's the lawyer in Wabo, Saskatchewan, that uses the PJH. Let's say he started in uh, 1997. Well, I started my law practice and moved it home in 1991. So I used my own logo in 1991, which gives me a prior better right to a trademark than uh, the fellow in Wabo. So he files... Um, I find out that he's filed, I can actually expunge his mark. Um, on the other side of the coin, if, um, uh, if he had an earlier date of first use than me and I filed and got a registered trademark, he could come back later and say, hey, you've got a registered trademark, but I had a prior better right than you, so I can actually stop you uh, from using it and cancel your registration. So the first thing you do is you start off with a trademark, by doing a trademark search. You search the registrar's office to find out if there's any registered or pending registrations. Then I would suggest you search the, um, again, sorry for that interruption, um, as well as doing a trademark search in Ottawa to see if there's a registered trademark out there. You'd want to search the yellow pages uh, uh, and the white pages for North America to see if somebody is out there is using the mark and hasn't really thought about uh, registering the trademark because they may have a prior better right than you. So what we've covered now are the four main types of intellectual property protection where you can take some action like registering your protection. We have trademarks, two elements, unregistered trademark right, registered trademark right. Then we have copyright, then we have patents, and we have industrial designs. How did I get five out there? We have four uh, with industrial designs. Those are all protected by statute. Trademark Act, Copyright Act, Patent Act, Industrial Design Act. And then there's this bundle of other intellectual property out there, or know-how, <clears throat> which is unprotectable by way of a statute. Um, and like copyright, we have to, uh, or pardon me, like trademarks, we have to fall back on the um, unregistered protection that might be available at common law. <clears throat> um, and this is what we call confidential information. Um, and uh, there's there's quite a broad package of, of things here. But um, to give you some idea, I had a client call me up one time and uh, he was the vice president of an advertising agency in Vancouver, a fairly high profile person. And he said, uh, Peter, he said, I just had a really great idea and I want to get a copyright trademark patent thingy on it. And when he said thingy, I, I knew there was a problem here. But anyway, being such an important client, I said, sure, come on right over. So he came over to my office and he came in and he sat down in front of me and he said, he had this brilliant idea. He did not want to do it himself. He wanted to sell the idea to Seaboard Advertising, um, but he wanted to protect his idea. And I said, oh, well, what's your idea? And he went, ooh, I can't tell you. He said, if I tell you, it's so fantastic, you'll go off and you'll do it yourself. Uh, and so I said, oh, well, really, um, do you have a loony? And he said, what? And I said, do you have a loony? And he said, well, yeah, I've got a loony. And I said, well, give me a loony. And he said, uh, why? And I said, never mind, just give me a loony. So he gave me the loony. And I said, all right, now you have retained me as your lawyer. Anything that you tell me, I must hold in confidence because I owe you a fiduciary duty to do that. And he said, oh, okay. Now, I was already his lawyer, and I had that fiduciary duty anyway, but I figured I might as well get a penny out of it, or a loony out of it. So anyway, he then, believe it or not, here's a person in you know three-piece biz, business you know, suit, and uh, you know a high, high player in the ad agency, and he gets up, and he goes over, and he looks up and down the hall outside my door, and he closes my door, and he sits down in front of me, and he goes, are you ready? And I said, yeah. He said, no, no. Are you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. And he said, okay, here it is. Advertising on the ceiling. And I sort of looked at him and I thought, oh, I'd better look really excited. I went, oh, good idea. 
Uh, and then I ran through them. I said, well, he doesn't have a name or a logo for it or anything like that, so there's no trademark. Um, there's not an artistic work to this, so it's just an idea, so no copyright. Uh, no industrial design or anything like that, so patents. Well, and then I stroked my client a bit. I said, well, let's see, it's ingenious, you know, you're, and uh, it definitely um, has utility. And I said, mm, but we have a problem with patents because it's not novel. I mean, we have advertising on TV, on the radio, on the side of buses, on the side of buildings, on billboards. Um, so this is just advertising on another surface. So I said, no patent. So I said, the only way you could protect this is by treating it as confidential information and getting a confidentiality agreement prepared, which you would then take to Seaboard Advertising and they would sign and saying that they would keep your ID in confidence and if they could not buy it off you, um, then they, they could not divulge it or use it themselves. These are commonly called non-disclosure agreements, again, because of the American influence. They call them NDAs, and we call them confidential information. But NDAs is shorter and easier for the Americans to remember, so we, um, uh, we will end up using that phrase ourselves. So NDAs. Um, <clears throat> so that's, um, that's what we do now. And, and so I prepared one for him, and he went over to, to Seaboard Advertising, and and he very carefully got somebody to sign on behalf of the company. And then the person that he was dealing with directly, he got them to sign and had them both signed under seal. Why? Because they're getting something, confidentiality, but they have not yet paid you anything for it. So there is not a binding contract there because of lack of consideration. So they get them signed under seal. Um, <clears throat> some companies will do that, some won't. You go to Microsoft, they will not sign an, an NDA, and uh, quite often they will not compensate you for a good idea. They will take it and do it themselves. Um, Boeing, aircraft company, uh, has a really good reputation for not only with employees, but um, people from outside the company. You come to them, they will not sign an NDA, but they will protect your idea. Um, just uh, one other anecdote on that. I had a, uh, an elderly fellow come into my office uh, one time and, he's, and he wanted to sue the Ford Motor Company. And I thought, oh, goody, here's a big lawsuit. And I said, why? What happened? And he said, well, um, he had an idea for a child's car seat. And he went down and talked to them about it. And they said, oh, you know, we've already thought of that. And he said, they're stealing my idea and I want to sue them. And I said, well, what was your idea? And he said, well, I had a car seat that would be built into the car and you sort of flip it and stick the kid in it if you want. And if you didn't want that, you'd flip it and it would become part of the seat and then you could stick your mother-in-law in there. <clears throat> and uh, and I said, well, you know, did, did they show you that they'd already had the idea or anything? And he said, no, they're stealing my idea. I want to sue them. So I asked him for a hefty retainer. I said, oh, you know, $5,000 to start and it's probably going to be $50,000 by the time we're finished the lawsuit. And he was aghast. He said he didn't have that money and you know isn't there anything else we could do and I said well yeah there is something and I said um, give me a retainer for $150 plus taxes and he did I took it out to my legal assistant I said cash that right away and then I came back in and I phoned the Ford Motor Company and I had talked to the fellow that he talked to and I said this is Peter J. Holm of the law firm of McConaughey, Turlock and Hove and I've just been retained by Mr. So-and-so to sue you for a breach of confidentiality um, and I'll be suing you plus uh, the company will be vicariously liable we thought at the other end of the line just about had a conniption. And when I explained what it was all about, he said, no, 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 we've, we've you know, done this for, we've had this idea for a long time. And he said, we have engineering drawings and a prototype. And I said, well, did you show either of those to uh, my client? And he said, no. So I got them ar arranged to have them meet. And I think it was like the day after the next day. Pardon me, they flew the uh, prototype out from Oshawa, Ontario. And had the engineering drawings there. My client went in, he sat down, he saw that they couldn't have whipped those up overnight. So obviously they'd thought of the idea before him. And uh, he came back to my office and sat in front of me and he said, uh, I want to thank you very much for solving my problem. And I said, oh, you're, you know, you're very much welcome. And he kept sitting there and I said, is there anything else I can do? And he said, well, I want my money back. And I said, uh, you know, why? And he said, well, you know, you didn't have to sue them. And I said, uh, no, it's, uh, 
$150 for solving your problem, and I did. So uh, unfortunately, he wasn't very happy about that, but um, uh, I could have just said, you know, give me a $1,000 retainer and started the lawsuit. And, uh, then we could have settled it, and I could have kept a lot more money, but uh, he wasn't satisfied in any event. So, But that's uh, confidential information. Now, there's confidential information with respect to uh, ideas like that where you want to divulge an idea um, and you want to protect it um, during your period of time. Or, or perhaps you have to have a prototype made, and so you've got your idea and you've got drawings, and you go to somebody to make the prototype. Well, you want that person to make a prototype for you, but sign an NDA first saying that he realizes that this is yours and it's... Um, uh, it's uh, not his to keep and make a profit off of. In employment situations, this comes up quite often because you're entering into a contract of employment, like with my husband-wife baker restaurant uh, couple and the fellow who said um, he had uh, recipes that he wanted to protect. And remember, we got them signed um, as part of the contract as opposed to signed under seal and things like that. Well, what you do is you'd put a confidentiality clause right into your employment contract, and then it becomes part of the contract of employment. The third way that it's protected, so it's by NDAs or by being inserted into a contract, um, the, um, the third way is um, that if you are a manager with a company, <clears throat> and during your time as a manager, you are exposed to intellectual property of a proprietary nature that belongs to the company, uh, or, or you're working with it, um, you cannot then leave and capitalize on that information, even if you have not signed a contract with respect to protecting it. Because as an employee, you are under a fiduciary duty to your employer. All right, well, that only took <clears throat> about 32 minutes to cover that material. And this uh, makeup is supposed to cover an hour and 20 minutes. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to back up and I'm going to deal with some of the HR management material um, so that we don't fall uh, too much farther behind. And that'll leave more time at the end for us to do some uh, practice problems. So I'm just looking at my screen here and it was uh, slide 144 that we were on and we were talking about HR management issues and we were talking about the remedies available to an employer to sue an employee who, um, uh, <clears throat> vice versa, the remedies of an employee to sue an employer uh, for wrongful dismissal, and that was damages and reinstatement, damages being the amount of notice that the employee should have received um, <clears throat> times the, uh, uh, the salary, and reinstatement just means getting your job back. And then we talked about the concept of wrongful leaving, which is the remedy whereby an employer can sue an employee who does not give the required notice. So if I'm a managerial employee and I've been with you for nine years, I am expecting to receive at least nine months pay in lieu of notice if you uh, want to let me go immediately, or at least nine months notice that my job is coming to an end. However, if I want to leave, um, I'm required to give you the same amount of notice that you're required to give me, and so I would be required to give you nine months' notice that I was leaving. If I just quit on two weeks' notice or whatever, and the company uh, suffered a loss because they could not fill my position quickly enough, then I would be entitled to, um, <coughs> pardon me, required to compensate my employer for nine months' pay less the two weeks' notice that I gave them. So um, <clears throat> it doesn't happen very often because... Um, uh, it's confined to industrial relations where there's the uh, union management relationship uh, in a master-servant relationship, which is the standard employer-employee relationship. Um, they, the judges don't like reinstating an employee to a situation where the parties would be uh, uh, have animosity towards each other. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the next screen is um, just listing some uh, legislation that is... Um, in the marketplace that helps employees. Uh, the first one is the Human Rights Act, which prevents um, things like uh, sexual harassment in the marketplace. Uh, there's uh, questions that uh, are inappropriate to be asked either during employment or during the um, application process. Uh, there's also pay equity as well. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. 
<clears throat> but uh, there's also the Employment Standards Act, which, which governs a lot of the workplace activities like hours of employment and safety equipment, things like that. There's the Workers' Compensation Act, which requires that a certain standard of protection of employees uh, exists in the marketplace, uh, industry by industry, and you have to follow those. You have to register with them. You have to pay WCB payments for your employees and that sort of thing. There's the Personal Information Protection Act, which we do not get into in this class to a great degree, but what it means is that I, as an employer, cannot solicit information from my employees unless I really need it for the purposes of being able to manage them correctly. And this is where it got a little dicey when we were talking about um, the um, uh, collecting information about <coughs> what your employees are doing in order to improve themselves in the marketplace in preparation for uh, perhaps having to get another job at some point. Um, and then there's also the Employment Insurance Act, which is a federal statute. You have to pay money in case you have to lay people off. They're entitled to so much um, EI. All right, um, I'd like to look uh, at um, one risk management issue, and that's uh, questions that you can uh, and cannot ask during a job interview. Um, and this goes hand in hand with things that you cannot put on the application form. For example, on an application form, you cannot ask um, a person's uh, sex um, unless it's a bona fide job qualification. You cannot ask for a social insurance number. You cannot ask them if they have a criminal record and that sort of thing. <coughs> then, um, but once once you have the application and once you've gone through the resumes and everything, and then you call people in and you want to have an interview with them, you have to be careful. You cannot ask any questions about race, um, ancestry, place of origin, and that sort of thing, unless it's directly related to job performance. So, for example, um, uh, my name is uh, Pete McCormick, and I'm obviously the Irish, and I'm coming in, and I'm applying for a job in a Japanese restaurant to be a server. Well, the it may be part of the ambience of the Japanese restaurant that not only are they giving you Japanese food, but they're giving you a Japanese um, uh, layout, and, and they want Japanese servers and everything like that. And so they may say, uh, well, uh, Mr. McCormick, are you Japanese? which in any other context would be absolutely forbidden. Uh, but in that situation, uh, they, they're, they're looking for certain qualifications uh, related to the job itself. Um, so unless it's a bona fide job qualification, BFOQ, um, then, uh, then you cannot ask those kinds of questions. Uh, political belief, um, I suppose if you're applying to be the uh, accountant for the uh, uh, Conservative Party of Canada, they may want to have somebody that's um, uh, that's also a party member, so they may be able to say, well, we want you to be a certified general accountant plus uh, a member of the Conservative Party, that sort of thing. Um, other than that, they cannot ask you. Um, religion, uh, you cannot ask uh, a person's religion, except in a situation where... Um, uh, you have uh, you're operating 24/7, and people are required to take shift work and work on the weekends. Well, there are certain religions that uh, suggest that you cannot work on Saturdays. There are certain religions that suggest you cannot work on Sundays, um, uh, and uh, they, certain religions where you're required to have a certain amount of time off to uh, for prayers and things like that. And and you either accommodate those people, um, <clears throat> or you have to um, make it plain that. Uh, accommodating one person would be unfair to the other people. So, for example, if I was um, uh, an Orthodox Jewish uh, person, um, I, I cannot work on Saturdays. Well, that would be unfair if I was expected to work five days a week. Um, and I, some weeks I work Monday to Friday, and then Tuesday to Saturday, and then Wednesday to Sunday. Um, and I say, well, no, I can't. What that would mean is that somebody else has to do it. And uh, that would be unfair. And so you, you, you cannot say, well, are you Jewish? Um, <clears throat> but you can say, is there any reason why you would be unavailable to work shift work either late in the evenings uh, or at night or um, any day of the week? And then if you have applicants that, that can do that and applicants that can't do that, you'd certainly be entitled to be fair to all your employees by hiring applicants that uh, are not restricted in some manner. But other than that, religion is out. 
Um, let's see, uh, sex, marital status, um, well, sex, uh, for example, um, <clears throat> unless it's relevant to the job, and I cannot think of very many jobs where that would be relevant, uh, you cannot ask a person's sex. Uh, marital status, uh, you, you, you cannot, again, say, oh, are you married? Are you going to have children? Um, I'd like to have an uh, you know, unmarried person that has you know, no aspirations to have children because I won't have to pay any child benefits and, and I won't have any problems with uh, promoting the person when they have them move away or something because their spouse moves. But you cannot do that. The bank's got in all sorts of problems with this because they would hire um, male and female, uh, but they would ask the females if this was the second job in the family and, and if your husband was transferred, uh, you know, you as the little woman would have to go with him, right? And so you wouldn't be available for promotion. And uh, they, uh, they ran afoul of the law and got into trouble. And so now what they do is they ask the person not to, oh, you know, are you married? Uh, you know, is this the second job? And are you the little woman or the, you know, are you the breadwinner or whatever? And they allow, uh, they, they just say is, you have to realize that if we hire you, your promotion requires you to take transfers to other branches, either around the province or around the country. And uh, if there's any restriction on that, then have to realize we may hire you, but you may not get promoted, that sort of thing. And um, then there is um, uh, sexual orientation. Uh, I just went to a, a human rights conference, and there's businesses that are getting into, into all sorts of problems because they will um, hire someone to find out that um, they are transgender, and uh, there's no facilities for them to go to the washroom, that sort of thing, and, and so they go and, and uh, they get uh, sued and, and rightfully so, or charged uh, rightfully so under the Human Rights Act. Um, let's see, just have to uh, take a look at this um, a little larger. Um, okay, sorry for that interruption. Um, <clears throat> the um, physical uh, or mental disabilities, you have to be very careful um, with uh, regard to this, um, either in the application or when you have an employee. Um, if they have some difficulties, you have to be prepared to accommodate them to the greatest extent possible. During the application process, you can't say, um, uh, gee, you're in a wheelchair, you're going to be able to do this job, um, or you cannot um, discriminate against them because of that. Um, when you hire them, we've already talked about this to a certain degree, if... Um, if they're uh, suddenly confined to a wheelchair or something like that, you have to do your best to accommodate them, uh, which means find another position for them um, until it causes the business undue hardship, whatever that means. If at some point it's undue hardship, then you can let the person go because of their physical disability or mental illness, or you don't have to hire them because of that. But you have to be extremely careful in situations like that. Um, and then, uh, you, of course, we've already talked about um, uh, uh, criminal matters. You, on an application form, you cannot ask somebody if they've got a criminal record unless they handle cash or valuable securities in your business. And even then, you cannot ask them that question straight away. What you have to do is you have to ask them <coughs> whether or not they, they are bondable. Because if they have a criminal record, you cannot get a bond on them which is insurance, and uh, therefore if it's required as part of the job, you don't have to hire that person. Um, you can see the rationale behind this in the sense that if a person has committed a crime, has been convicted, and has served a sentence or her sentence, then she becomes or he becomes an upstanding member of the community again, and so their criminal record should be irrelevant. Um, and if we don't hire them because they have a criminal record, then they will be forced to go back to a life of crime and it will become a vicious circle. So we're supposed to provide them that opportunity. Um, it's hard for the business because um, obviously um, there's a greater risk in hiring somebody like that. Um, so you cannot ask them if they have a criminal record, either on the application form or during the job interview. You can, if they handle cash or valuable securities, ask them if they're bondable as long as getting a bond is a requirement of their employment. Okay, if you say, are you bondable, but you don't get a bond on them, then obviously you're trying to circumvent the legislation and you will be in trouble.
trouble. All right, um, education. That seems to be about the only thing left in which you can uh, fully discuss um, the, uh, the person's uh, background uh, knowledge. Okay, so you have to be really careful. That's a risk management issue. You just have to make sure you don't do those things. Another risk management measure, of course, is on the next slide, which is 147, and that is you want to have um, uh, the, uh, the seven things that I have listed on that slide, and um, you want to make sure that, um, uh, that you know this for the exam purposes, because I could certainly say what are five of the seven, or in the problem on Part C, I could say this HR manager for this business should have these things in place. You know, obviously, um, you want to assess your employment needs. In other words, what employees you actually require for the job. Um, then you want to make sure that there is um, uh, a, a job description, which means exactly what that person is required to do to perform the work. Then from that, you figure out the job specifications, which is all that experience and education or training that a person needs to have in order to be able to do the job. Then uh, you want to make sure that uh, you um, have an application, perform, application form prepared and vetted by your lawyer. You want to go through a very thorough analysis of not only the applications, covering letters, but contact the people that provide um, references. Then when you hire the person, um, you want to make sure that you have a file on them and that during the uh, period of employment, at least before the end of their uh, probationary period, and probably once a year after that, you have a meeting with the employee to assess how they're doing. And then you want to have a sign-off procedure, um, which will allow you then to um, uh, record what goes on. Um, and the reason that you have this is not to protect yourself against a lawsuit, because uh, what you want to do is do this because it's good business. You want to have this because what it means is you will hire the people with the proper training. Um, you will supervise them properly. You will um, um, uh, meet with them and record with, with them what they're doing right and tell them what they're doing wrong, or you know, vice versa. You tell them what they're doing wrong and then you tell them how to do it right and you give them training if necessary. Because losing employees, whether they quit because they can't do the job or whether you fire them because they can't do the job is a huge cost to your business. That's the first reason that you have a file. The second reason you have a file is if they are upset and they decide to seek legal counsel to commence a lawsuit against you, you will have your ducks in a row and you will be able to defend yourself. The last part of the chapter um, really uh, deals with uh, the other side of the coin. We've talked about master-servant relationships. Now we're going to talk about uh, union management relationships. So we've gone from the scenario where judge-made law and statutes cover the situation to, to the situation where we have um, the uh, labor relations statutes, which sets the framework. But really, it's the collective bargaining process that, that deals with the HR management issues. So collective bargaining is the process um, whereby um, a union and a, a, a company uh, negotiate um, the uh, terms of employment, not for each individual employee, but for all the employees together. And um, what happens is you have to know a little bit of terminology. The first thing is uh, certification. If a union comes into your business and they uh, try to unionize your employees, you should be very careful how you stop them, um, uh, their activities, and you should get legal advice for sure. But if they, if the union gets in and they organize enough employees and then they go to the Labor Relations Board and they say, we think we have enough representation to become the union to represent these employees, they're asking to be certified. <clears throat> the certification is the creation of a union. Um, so, and then there is the Labor Relations Board is the, um, the uh, group in uh, Victoria that actually take care of the certification. And then there's the bargaining agent. The bargaining agent is the union that wants to represent the employees. And if I have a shop where we manufacture things out of wood and metal and then we ship them out by truck, 
I could technically have three unions in there. I could have the Metal Workers of America, I could have the Woodworkers of America, or I could have the Teamsters, <coughs> or any combination of those. So um, that's the that's the, those concepts. The um, uh, the bargaining unit, on the other hand, is the number of employees that are going to be represented by a bargaining agent. And these terms can find find their way into Part A of the exam. Okay, and quite often do. Um, the collective agreement. What's that? I have. If it's a master and servant relationship, we would have an employment contract, either verbal or partly verbal and partly oral, or all oral. It should be written, but we would have a contract between you and me. Um, but I don't have a contract with you as a union employee. I have a contract with all the employees, and that's called the collective agreement. So it's merely a contract between the employer and the members of the union. And uh, <clears throat> arbitration is when there's a dispute between union and management over the meaning of a collective agreement, then you go to um, arbitration to have that resolved. So what you have to know about union management relationship is there are four types of disputes and four methods whereby those disputes can be resolved. <coughs> well, actually three, but they're covered off. So I could easily make a Part B exam question, and what are the four types of labor disputes? How are they resolved? And then I could say, and what is the definition of a collective agreement or something like that to make it five marks. Okay, so what are the four types of disputes? Well, they're covered in um, uh, in slide 151, 152, and um, uh, 153, and uh, 154. The four are jurisdictional disputes, recognition disputes, interest disputes, and rights disputes. And it's really quite easy to remember. Jurisdiction. I said I could have three unions. Well, if I do not have a union, and those three unions descend on my business, and the metal workers are trying to organize the employees that work with metal, and the woodworkers are trying to organize the employees that work with wood, and the teamsters are trying to organize my truck drivers, that would be fine. But they don't. They all want to represent all the employees because then they get more dues and they're more powerful. So the woodworkers try to organize my whole shop. The metal workers try to organize my whole shop. And the teamsters try to organize my whole shop. So I have the unions fighting amongst themselves to see who gets to um, be the union for everybody. This is a jurisdictional dispute. They're fighting over who has jurisdiction to do that. That's really easy to remember, and it will be on the exam. So it's probably a choice on the exam for you to answer, or it'll be in part A as a definition. Well, you know, I might be sitting back as the employer saying, well, sure, they should be unionized. I don't care. Um, I'm paying pretty much union wages, and, uh, and so go to it, guys. Fight it over. I don't care. But let's say a union comes in and tries to organize my employees and I don't want a union, or I don't think that's the appropriate union, then I challenge them. I challenge their right to unionize my employees. And this is a recognition dispute. I refuse to recognize that union's right to represent my employers. Okay. The third one is when the union wins and the union gets appointed as the bargaining agent, now we have to have a collective agreement. So I have to bargain with the union, and the union has to bargain with me about the terms that will go into our collective agreement. And that's called an interest dispute, because we are both fighting over our interests. Okay, we're both interested in it, but that's not the point. I want my interests protected, they want the employee's interests, interests protected, so they're fighting over it. The fourth one is eventually we will get a collective agreement, It'll be signed and will begin to operate underneath this contract. Then we get to a point where we have a confusion over a term. So, for example, um, one of my employees gets caught with his hand in the tiller. I fire him. And the union says, you can't do that because under the term of the collective agreement, it says before anyone is dismissed, we must have dis consultation. 
Well, I say, well, no, no, no. If I'm laying people off for a short period of time or indefinitely, sure, I, we want to consult. But this isn't that. This is like, that's a breach of the contract. I should be able to fire them. No, no, consultation, fire, consultation, fire. So we get into this battle. And these kinds of disputes, because we have a collective agreement, have to go to be settled in a different manner. So we call these our rights disputes because we're both fighting over our rights under the contract. So uh, jurisdictional disputes, recognition disputes, interest disputes, and rights disputes. How are the four resolved? Jurisdiction and rights disputes are both settled by the certification process. The statute sets out what the union has to do to get certified and what I have to show to stop it. Okay, So jurisdictional disputes between unions and recognition disputes between the employer and the union are settled by certification. Once a union is certified and we get into bargaining, our, our interest disputes are settled by the collective bargaining process. And it's set out in the statute, and we don't get into it in the big way. But what you have to remember is that you have to bargain in good faith. And if you cannot come to agreement, either side can ask for a conciliation officer, who is a mediation officer who comes over and tries to mediate. Oh, come on, you know, business. You're, you've been paying $14 an hour to these employees, and now you're only offering them 12 Is that fair? Come on, union. You've been, being, you've been receiving 12 and suddenly you want 24 is that really realistic? And the mediator tries to get them together. And if he can get them to agree, then it can be settled and bingo, the problem solved. Or if the mediator cannot settle the matter, then um, he, he or she cannot dictate a settlement. Um, uh, so the, uh, the, you then go back to collective bargaining, at which point you're probably going to have a strike or a lockout. A strike is when the union gets really mad and they say, oh, we're going on strike. And the next thing you know, they're walking around your plant and holding signs, union or management unfair, management unfair. Um, or the employer says, well, that's it. You know, we're, we're locking you out. And uh, they slap a lock in the door and you come to work the next day and you can't get in. You're not being paid any money. <clears throat> well, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of like a showdown at the OK Corral. Who's going to give in first in a situation like that? Because a business cannot lock you out forever, otherwise they'll go out of business. And the union cannot go on strike forever, otherwise the business will go on, um, out of business and, and everybody will be out of work. So there's give and take in it. Um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> so you, you have this, uh, and oh, so the, anyway, the union says we're going on strike. Well, right in the statute it says there's a cooling off period of 72 hours. We're going on strike yeah, immediately. Well, immediately, 72 hours later. Why 72 hours later? It gives them a chance to rethink the situation. They look out the side window and, oh my gosh, it's snowing and sleeting and it's freezing out there. And Do we want to be standing outside holding a sign saying, you know, management unfair? And, and, the, and, the, and the management is saying, well, man, you know, we, if we lock them out... Um, got that big contract that we have to get done by the end of the month and it you know would be in breach of contract and maybe we should go back and see if we can work this out. So there is this cooling off period. How long can a strike last if uh, if they go on strike or a lockout occurs? Um, well unless it's an essential service that's governed by legislation it can go on forever. There's a union in England that is uh, it must be about the 120th year of their strike. Uh, it was a coal mine that was owned by a very rich family in England, and they didn't treat their employees very well, and the employees went on strike, and the family was so rich that they really didn't need the wealth from the, uh, or the money from the coal mine, so they just said, okay, well, folks, let's, let's wait until they run out of strike money. Well, they were on strike and on strike and on strike year after year after year, and pretty soon all the employees passed away. Their children come out, and they carry the signs out, and they go... Union such and such is still on strike, and they slam those signs into the ground, and the coal mine is defunct and, and no longer operating, and it's not likely that the um, uh, the dispute will ever be settled. So it could go on forever, but uh, firemen and nurses and the police and uh, schools, essential services, which means the government can, if it has the gumption, the um, will 
can step in and order them back to work and order a settlement. Um, that's provincially. Federally, the longshoremen um, are a union that uh, falls under the federal jurisdiction, and um, the uh, uh, and they, they were given the right to strike under Pierre Trudeau, so we'll have to see what Justin Trudeau does. But Pierre Trudeau gave them the right to strike, and they went on strike, and it was so essential to Canada that we have the longshoremen getting products and wheat and coal out of the country that um, uh, ships were being backed up in the harbor. The uh, governor just uh, ordered them back to work and gave them a big whack of money. And then when the uh, collective agreement came up again, they went on strike and the government ordered them back to work and gave them a whack of money. And I don't think, I may be mistaken, but I don't think they yet have managed to uh, negotiate a collective agreement. So essential services, back to work. That's the collective bargaining process. But let's say we managed to negotiate with the union and we managed to get a collective agreement signed and then there's a rights dispute. We get into that, uh, hey, he stole the money, so I fired him. Hey, you have to consult with us before you can dismiss somebody routine. That um, uh, should go to arbitration with the Labor Relations Board, member administrative law, okay, arbitration. And um, if the union strikes during a collective agreement, it is called a wildcat strike and it is illegal. The management can go to um, the uh, court and get an injunction to get them to stop striking um, and go back to work and can get damages paid to the business. Okay, so that's called a wildcat strike. There has to be an existing created or collective agreement in place. So if you're negotiating, you can go on strike because you do not have a collective agreement. Once you have a collective agreement, <coughs> you're no longer have the option of going on strike, you actually have to um, sue the, um, or pardon me, go to the Labor Relations Board um, to get the matter resolved. Okay, and that was that was in Part C of last year's exam. We'll go over it in class and, and you'll see it there that the union went on strike because, you know, they were being treated unfair during the collective agreement. And, and so that's your, that's to twig in your mind that one of the issues is um, rights disputes which have to go to arbitration and that's an illegal strike. Um, okay, that uh, that concludes um, employment law. Let me just quickly look at my slides here and make sure that I haven't missed anything. Essential services, wildcat strikes, got it. Um, jurisdictional disputes, got it. Um, that's pretty much it. So that, that uh, brings us up to date and puts us in a good position. The, uh, the next material we'll be going into is sole proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. We've got more than enough time to handle that. Um, so the next class, I think we do the quiz for half an hour, and then we start that lecturing. You should all be looking at um, last year's final exam, which is in your lecture materials. And now, this time, you should know that it's really going to make a difference to your mark if you do the problem C that we will go over in the last class before the exam. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next class.